Hello friends, today we will be talking about how the drum brakes work on the 6th generation Mitsubishi Mirage. This includes all vehicles made from 2012 to present. For the Mirage, two different styles of drum brakes are offered. What is seen here is the one we will be talking about. It was offered from 2012 to 2016 in the North American market where I am located. If you are located somewhere else in the world, it may Maybe that this one or the other style is offered for different periods in time or what have you. The other drum brake setup as shown in this picture is offered from 2017 to present in the North American market. The drum is approximately 23 millimeters larger in diameter, giving you better braking. It is a more common setup, so I'm sure you can find a video somewhere else about it if you're interested. Here's a quick look at the aftermarket Raybestos brake hardware kit I bought. It does include all the hardware you would need for this brake job, and the hardware does appear to be color-coded, but there is no index as to what color part goes where, so it's possible that the color coding is just for the factory. Also, you would think that the paint may be some sort of rust prevention measure, but as you can see here, the paint is literally just applied directly on top of the spring whenever you pull the springs apart to install them. The paint breaks apart and the bare metal is exposed. Here's what my replacement shoes look like. You should notice that the shoes are all 100% identical. Front, back, left, right are all the same. For reference, here's what my hand looks like next to a brand new shoe. Here you can see me measure the part that the lining is attached to, which is called the lining table. It is 1.7 millimeters. Here's me measuring the thickness of the lining plus the lining table at 5.7 millimeters. That means the lining itself is only 4 millimeters thick. If we look at the factory service manual, we can see that new shoes are sold with a 3.8 millimeter thick lining and that the shoes should be replaced when the lining is at 2 millimeters. That means that we get 1.8 whole millimeters for all of our braking needs before the lining needs to be replaced. This video is not intended to be a comprehensive tutorial on how to change your own brake shoes, but just in case anyone wants to use it as such, I have included these diagrams on how to jack the car up safely. So if we look at the back of the car right under where the license plate is, you can see right here is the rear tow hook. This is the rear jacking point for the car. Here you can watch me attempt to jack the rear of the car up from the tow hook and then I promptly realize that the jack will not raise the vehicle up high enough for the wheels to come off the ground. This clip was solely included for entertainment purposes. For the sake of time we'll skip the part where I jacked the car up. Here you can see me remove the lug nuts that I already loosened while the vehicle was on the ground and through the powers of movie magic we'll speed through this. But as I take this wheel off, you'll notice something really interesting. This dust cap that is supposed to be on the drum, protecting the axle nut from the elements, is actually stuck to my rim. It is supposed to be held in place with friction and a semi-dry sealant. We will now use a 30 millimeter socket to remove our self-locking nut that is holding the drum in place. According to these instructions from the factory service manual, we are not allowed to use an air or electric tool and we should not turn this nut at a rate greater than 8 turns per 1 minute, which is oddly specific. The uh, breaker bar I'm using has a pivot built into it, but if yours does not, or for when you use your torque wrench to tighten this nut back up, you may need an extension if you are not using a deep enough socket, otherwise you'll have a hard time reaching below the quarter panel only. Here you can see I use this cheater bar. It's actually a shower curtain rod, but I am low budget, so it is what it is. If you're wondering why I don't just move the breaker bar to be vertical with the nut and then spin it as I did with the lug nuts, it's because this axle nut has too much resistance for me to do that, and I can't spin it the way it is right now in the perpendicular position because it hits the ground. That is why you see me constantly taking it off and putting it on to undo this nut. 
As you will see in just a second, for the last few turns required to remove this nut, the resistance drops rapidly and it is suddenly very easy to twist. Here we can see a photo of that OEM axle nut. So the bottom part that's on the table is the part that would press against the brake drum. It is flat and the top part, if we look at the very top face furthest away from us, we can see that horizontally flat piece. The outside face of this nut has been kind of squished in three separate places, evenly spaced around the outside perimeter. This is to give the nut a predictable resistance and friction during install. This is why this is considered a self-locking nut, even though it does not have any type of sealant or thread locker used during installation. It's also likely why this nut cannot be installed or removed with the use of a power tool as it may modify the deformation and change the amount of resistance the nut has. In this photo, the three deformations on the outside face of the nut are much more easily observed. Because these deformations are on the outside face of the nut during nut removal as previously shown in the video, once the nut is removed past the point of these deformations, it becomes very easy to rotate as resistance goes down substantially. I think that these deformations were done on the outside face of the nut so that during installation the nut can be easily started by hand onto the threads without the use of a tool reducing the risk of cross threading. After this nut is removed if you're having trouble removing the drum, firstly make sure that your e-brake is down. If you've already done that you can try and use the e-brake stroke adjustment to further loosen the e-brake as shown in this diagram here. You will need a deep well socket for this. Here's a photo of the e-brake adjustment nut. It is at the back of the center console. If you are still having trouble removing your drum, it is possible that this is because a lip has formed on the inside face of your drum. By design, these shoes do not come into contact with the inner edge of the drum, so rust can sometimes form on this edge, creating a sort of lip that will catch the shoes as you try to pull the drum off. Mitsubishi does thankfully have a solution for this. As shown on the diagram on the right, on the back of the dust shield does have a hole that's normally covered by a rubber plug. You can pull this rubber plug out, use a flathead screwdriver to reach in and release the auto adjuster, causing the shoes to uh, contract, allowing them to clear the drum. We will talk more on how this auto adjuster works later. If you are still having trouble removing the drum, Mitsubishi does sell this tool that will help you remove it. The left and right pieces in this diagram attached to lug studs using lug nuts and then the center is rotated pulling the drum off of the axle. I have never seen this in use or for sale. I could not find it for sale anywhere online but I am sure it is hella expensive. Personally for me I didn't have to do any of these things. My drum just pulled right off. Here's a diagram of the drum components. You can see number one is a snap ring, two is the wheel bearing, three is the drum. If you're trying to buy aftermarket brake drums, you should be aware that some of them do come bare. That is without a bearing, tone ring, snap ring, or lug studs. The bearing is press fit, so I don't believe it's possible to install a bearing at home unless you own a press. Here's what a brand new OEM drum looks like. Here's what the inside of that brand new drum looks like. As you can see it says max diameter 181.0 millimeters. And of course you can also see the four lug studs that were pressed in at the factory. Looking at the factory service manual we can see that the standard inner diameter of the drum is 180 millimeters. That means that we get a total of one millimeters worth of wear that we're allowed which is actually 0.5 millimeters of wear because it's a diameter, not a radius that's being measured. These two yellow arrows point at the two holes that your snap ring pliers would go in to remove the snap ring that's holding the bearing in place. Here we can see what Mitsubishi refers to as the vehicle speed detection encoder, although I've heard others call it the ABS tone ring, ABS pulse ring, or ABS encoder ring. It is essentially a plastic ring that has some magnets embedded in it that in conjunction with the Hall effect sensor mounted on the car 
will be used to measure the wheel speed. Here are some photos of what it looks like with the drum removed. At about 92,000 kilometers here are what my rear brakes currently look like. I will be using a photo of a brand new set of rear brakes for most of my explanations. Here is a diagram of the rear brakes. Do not worry if it does not yet make sense to you. It hopefully will by the end of the video. If it does not, then feel free to leave a comment down below. Shown here is the wheel speed sensor. It is a Hall effect sensor that detects the magnetic field from the wheel speed encoding ring mounted on the drum. And it sends that as a signal to the computer to allow it to calculate the speed that this wheel is rotating. The next thing we will be talking about is the wheel cylinder. Here is a poorly drawn cross section of what a wheel cylinder kind of looks like on the inside. In yellow here are the two pistons contained within the wheel cylinder. Whenever hydraulic fluid pressurizes the area in between these two pistons, as shown in blue, the pistons are forced outward which pushes the shoes outward. And the area of the hydraulic fluid resides, there are these two holes as depicted in red that go through the dust shield and out the back. The lower one, which is roughly in the center of the wheel cylinder, is for the brake line. It's for the normal braking operation. And the upper one is for a bleeder screw. Since air naturally rises, if there's an air bubble in this wheel cylinder, whenever the bleeder screw is opened, that air can be released. Here is a diagram of the Mirage's wheel cylinder. Note that both sides have identical parts and function identically. So number one is the dust boots. Number three is the piston. Notice the end of the piston has a notch of sorts for the chute to sit in. Number four is called a wheel cup. It's to create a good seal for the hydraulic fluid. Number five is a spring to hold the wheel cups in place in the absence of hydraulic fluid, such as during transport or while this is sitting on a parts shelf. And number six is the bleeder screw with its own dust cap. The brake line is not depicted in this, but it would be below the bleeder screw. If we turn our attention to the bottom of the assembly here, we can see this metal piece that's fixed in place. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's composed of these two metal studs that are fixed in place. So as the pistons move outward, the shoes pivot on this, these two round studs. Also note that similar to how the brake shoe web at the top end is in a channel at the end of the pistons, at the bottom end, it is in this channel that is a part of the backing plate. I also notice that this spring down here's sole purpose is to prevent the shoes from exiting the notch that's holding them in place at the bottom. These two main springs of the assembly have a very important purpose. They are to hold the shoes away from the drum when the brakes are not being applied. If you're wondering, these springs have a straight segment for a very simple purpose. The top one is so that I can clear the wheel cylinder, and the bottom one is so that I can clear the bearing. I'm sure the resistance of these springs is calculated so that the brake pedal feel is ideal. And this spring right here connects the auto adjuster to the shoe, and this other spring is part of the auto adjuster we'll talk about right now. This is what a bottom-up view of the auto adjuster looks like. I'd like you to notice that the bottom edge of this auto adjuster is flat because it presses against the backing plate. Right here you'll see that there's this pin that allows this part to freely rotate. It also allows it to slide left and right in this channel that you can't see but is on the back side of it. Right here there are a series of teeth on both parts that when pushed against each other prevents the left piece from rotating. Depicted in green right here is this spring that will normally hold this left piece against the main body of the auto adjuster and will keep the teeth pressed against each other preventing this left piece from rotating. Shown in brown here on the right is where the brake shoe lining web, which is the middle part of the brake shoe, rests. Shown in purple here is the parking lever which is attached to the back of the brake shoe's lining web. Shown in green here is a spring that holds this brake shoe to the auto adjuster. Depicted in brown here is the other brake shoe. Note that the auto adjuster goes through the hole in this brake shoe. This black segment here is being used to represent the width of the hole in the brake shoe. Here it is all together now. You should note that when the brakes are not being applied, 
the force from those two main springs that pull the shoes together is being applied against this auto adjuster. When the brakes are being applied, the wheel cylinder pistons will apply an equal amount of force to both shoes and will push them outward as shown by the red arrows in this diagram. Since the auto adjuster is being held to the right shoe in this diagram with the right spring as shown in green, this entire auto adjuster assembly wants to move to the right. The auto adjuster will move to the right as needed and will consume the extra space in the hole on the left shoe as shown in blue here. If the hole does not have enough space, then the left piece of the auto adjuster will want to move to the left. This leftward force of the left shoe against the auto adjuster does two things. Firstly, it causes this left piece of the auto adjuster to move away from the main body of the auto adjuster, working against that green spring and causing the two sections to want to part. Secondly, because this left piece of the auto adjuster is on that pivot, it causes that left piece to want to rotate, and if the force is great enough, this left piece will in fact rotate, a new set of teeth will engage, and it will remain in this position indefinitely. In this diagram, you can see what the auto adjuster looks like in the fully extended position. This is what it would look like if your shoes were completely worn. Here's a comparison of the state the auto adjuster would be in with a new set of shoes compared to a used set of shoes. With a brand new set of shoes, the adjuster in the fully retracted position would have the left piece have this bottom edge as pointed out by this arrow flat with the rest of the body. The reason for this is this has to sit flat against the backing plate. Here's what my auto adjuster looks like. You can see the left shoe kind of sits right about there and then the right shoe sits right about here. <coughs> And we can see with both shoes together, this is the tooth section right here. It would sit kind of like this. And then this spring goes between the auto adjuster and the left shoe. And you can see here as the right shoe pulls away from the left one, this ratcheting motion occurs. And then you can also see that that pivot point I showed you on the bottom side, there's a slot. So it allows it to move from side to side. And then here's me fully retracting it for the installation of my new shoes. Now that we've learned how the auto adjuster works, if we look back at this diagram that teaches us how to reset the auto adjuster from outside of the drum, we can see that's referring to using a flathead screwdriver to grasp onto this little hook part of the left piece on this auto adjuster and then you'd have to use your flathead screwdriver to overcome the spring force of both the adjuster spring and the springs that hold the shoes together to be able to cause the auto adjuster to retract. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the parking brake. The parking brake cable is housed within that spring shown on the bottom of the image. You can tell that this photo is from the right side of the vehicle because the cable exits the right side of the backing plate and since the cable travels towards the front of the vehicle where the e-brake lever is you know this is the right side of the vehicle that cable is housed within that spring to prevent the cable from tangling up and twisting and it is attached to what is called a parking lever the pin at the top of the parking brake lever goes through the left brake shoe and it has this notch for the auto adjuster so whenever the cable is pulled tight the lever pivots against the auto adjuster which pushes the left shoe and it pushes the right shoe through the auto adjuster. The last thing I'd like to talk about is if we look at where the middle of the shoe sits there are these holes or channels and if we look at the shoes themselves the lining tables have these nibs in the center that sit within these channels. The purpose of this is because the springs that hold these shoes together are off-center. They cause a slight rotational force against these shoes and this channel prevents the shoes from rotating outward and rubbing against the drums. This is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. For anyone watching this with the intention of trying to diagnose their own braking problems, I've thrown in a couple of screenshots here from the factory service manual that I thought might be useful. Feel free to leave a comment below if you have any questions, comments, or concerns.